the Third World series. Yeah, I haven't got any of the covers. <clears throat> but again, you see, yeah, all I've got is the last one, which there's the front and there's the back. And uh, it was a gatefold, I think, probably so it opened up. What do you do for third for an album for a band called Third World? Well, you do a piece of Third World art. I've done the Coptic art for Rico. Hydraman and didn't need they, that was styles unto themselves. But for Third World, what what can it? Well, Haitian art. Haitian art has a particular look. You go again, Google and say Haitian art. You'll see a whole lot of stuff that looks like the Third World album guns. <clears throat> so I kind of thought, let me let me get into a Haitian art. How's it look? How do they do the things? What's the whole identity of Haitian art? And uh, came up with the picture. There was a very similar picture I took it from, the first one. But then the second, I had to completely invent all the rest. But that's all it was, basically copying as if I was a Haitian artist. And... Uh, by, by the end, I was even signing those Dan. Like, I like the idea it was there was some guy in Haiti that did these covers, not me. Because, of course, I would never have done that myself. And uh, Dan was... Uh, Dan was a raster for Scorpion. And Eichmann was Cancer, so he was Levi. I am a Levi. I'm, I'm Cancer. So Dan, Dan, I signed it, was a Scorpio, and the idea that there was this guy. And I often have people saying, you didn't do the last one, did you? Because some guy called Dan did it, didn't it? You know. So what can I say about it? That's all. And I tell you what, it was, Chris loved it so much that um, we said, let's do more like that. And I was thinking Chicago. Do you know the Chicago album covers? Yeah. And every one is the same logo. Chicago, 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 you know. So they told a story. Man, woman, man. And then now we found love. They get together, they have a child. They leave, Bab they leave Babylon, yeah, to go to the promised land. And um, third world, by the end of uh, Journey to Addis, which is basically is this, but by then, Third World wanted their own picture of them because they weren't really rascals, Third World. They were more like college kids. And uh, they were fighting and fighting against having yet another one of these. And uh, I was sent into a room, I was in Nassau, because I actually did that in Nassau. Um, I was in Nassau, and they were in Nassau, and they were, no, no, no. They were saying to Alex Masucci and Blackwood, no, no, no. I said, go in, go in and talk to them. But I literally sat there and bullshitted them over the whole rest of things to say, and that's why, you see, it's got to be the story's been told. You know, the donkey's got to be then free. The children cross over into, into, the, land, into the promised land, and like, you know, Moses... He cannot, and he doesn't cross into the promised land. And they were sitting there going, oh, fuck, you know, we can't argue with this guy. And um, so I was able to be able to get the last thing. And I came out and I said to Blackwell and Alex Musucci, who was the producer, I said, okay, done. And they would say, how the hell did you do that? You know, well, I explained Rastafarianism to a third world. So this is one of my favorite images. During the 80s, as I say, it was no longer doing like beautiful little illustrations. It was then much more back to basics with images. So I was doing a lot more photography, actually basic learning photography. And uh, that was the first photographic cover I did, which it's an image, it's not a photograph. You know what I mean? It's a photograph, but it's not, it's an image. And of course you could do that on Photoshop today very easily. But in those days, to get that, you had to slide the negatives across and everything else. I mean, that was quite an achievement. And Bill Laswell was the um, producer on that. 
And Bill Laswell and I were always at loggerheads. Did, did we didn't like one another? But when Roger Trilling, Roger Trilling took this in late at night to the studio they were working and showed Bill Laswell, he said, Wow, yes. I was so very pleased about that color. B-52s, I had an assistant, Chris. I love Devo. Remember Devo? And it was interesting. I mean, I remember going to see Devo live. I thought, oh my God, I love Devo. And uh, Chris loved Devo. I said, you've got to sign Devo. They were up for signing. And he went after Devo and he couldn't get Devo. They went to Warner Brothers, even though Ireland at the time was releasing their records through Warner Brothers. And so he got the B-52s instead. So they will be annoyed by that for a start if they ever watch it, but they won't see that they came in as a consolation prize. And they are a kind of absurdist band, right, aren't they? They're absurdist. They're a kind of pastiche, very funny, very arty of a 50s band, right? And they were living, they were friends with this assistant I had called George DeBose who was a kind of technical assistant photographer to Eric Bowman, who I'd known for years. And he was friends with the B-52s and they lived in his loft. And his loft was a prior whorehouse. And it was all black, never, ever, ever painted it white. And, and there were male cubicles at the end of this place, right? Male urinals at the end of the space. And all along the wall, were these divided little partitions with little black curtains over, right? Where the girls took their tricks before George DeBose took it over. And when the B-52s came to New York, they slept individually in these cubicles of this whorehouse. <laughs> anyway, so George took some photographs of them, which as a photograph unto itself, it's like, can they do something? You know, can they do something? But the fact that they're just standing there, they knew exactly how to just be this absurdist thing, you know. What I could see immediately that, yes, you could do something with that photograph, which is make it into what I made it into, these flat, flat colors. And I, and I remember when I did it, took this photograph and did it. I knew that Chris Pratt would just adore it. And he said afterwards, 40% of the sales of the B-52s are down to the cover, he said, which is something you would never say to me, because that means paying someone money. Yeah. But um, so it was great. And it was hilarious. And they hated it. They detested it. And so, again, they were recording in Nassau. And uh, I went... Yeah, I was in New York, so I was just going down to Nassau. And he said, you've got to go in and make them like this album cover. And they didn't like the album cover. Fred wanted a picture of the planet Venus. And, um, and it was the only time in my life I've ever done something for someone that it was an argument. Because what was the, what's the point of arguing with an act? You want to give them something they want, not something they hate. And so I, I did argue for it because I knew it would help them. I knew it would work. I knew it was going to be a strong album. And if you were around in 1980, you'd just know how much impact that had. Every record company were calling up saying, can you do a B-52s for us? And um, so they hated me. They hated the cover. And we pushed it on them. And, um, and Chris used to go and they say, please tell that Terry Wright. And he said, oh, I can't do anything about it. You know, Tony Wright is this prima donna. I, I, I'm not sure about it at all, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know. So, you know, and he was like, go on, go in. So that was it. And then the end story about it was that he took it to Warner Brothers, who sat there and hated it and said, we're not using it. It's a piece of shit. It's awful. And I don't know how he found it because he was in a state, because he was in Los Angeles, with this cover, and them saying, no, we don't like it. And um, I don't know how he found me, because I was at some girlfriend's house, who he didn't know. He didn't know her phone number, but he managed to find his phone number, and phone me, and I was there. 
And he said, I'm a Warner Brothers, and they hate it. What the hell do I do? And I said, tell him to print it. And he said, okay, done. That's the beef to choose. Again, any single thing I've ever done that was good, and afterwards people loved it, everyone hated it. So you always knew, often, if you'd done something really good, everyone would hate it. So I did this with Steve. He was down in um, his little country mansion. No, I went down to meet him first, and he gave me the record. He gave me the real to real. And I played the real to real and came up with various ideas. Late, later, he said, Oh, fuck, I didn't give you that real to real, did I? I've got to have that back. I said, I don't know, I just throw it I don't know where it was. I wish I had that real to real today because it was his original mixes, which I like better than the finished record, which was often the case that I would get a, a record and like the record better than the finished thing because it had been mixed for radio and things, you know. Anyway, so he liked He said, yes, let's do it. And we took it into New York to a, ma a marketing guy that uh, had been hired specifically to market this record and said, it's awful. It's going to kill the record, blah, blah, blah. That was in England. So I went back to New York and put it into production and made it so he couldn't do anything about it. And again, it was done the same year as this. Yeah, uh, the, you cannot imagine. You see, record, as I said, going back right to the beginning, album covers mattered that, that in those days. It was the one thing that identified the record. And the fuss that the world, or New America, made about that cover it was just crazy, crazy. I mean, I had had acts years. I still have emails about this cover. But people say they've got it on their wall. It's a favorite image of all time. Other people hate the thing. It's one guy called, um, I forget his name, 20 years later, I was doing a cover for him. And he was really pleased because I'd done art with the diver. And we were fast friends. His, friend, his wife was Michelle Pfeiffer's sister. And his best friend was Kiefer Sutherland. And, uh, and he used to stop people in the street. He became a bit enamored with them. He stopped people in the street and said, who's the best looking? And they said, well, him, he goes, you see, you see. And you know something? He did Ark of the Diver. And the whole time he was going, well, you did Ark of the Diver, you did Ark of the Diver. And he got back to Los Angeles, I was in New York, and he called me up one day and he said, Tony, I've got terrible news. They've changed the cover of Ark of the Diver. I said, no way, no way. He said, yeah, it's a piece of shit. You wouldn't, I cannot believe what they've done. It's an absolute piece of shit. I said, well, describe it. He said, well, it's like this stupid little black figure with a green background and a little pink. So he said, well, a piece of shit. I said, that is Ark of the Diver. And he went, that is Ark of the... Right? And he never, ever dared speak to me again. When I went to New York, it was the first kind of big argument I had with Chris Blackwell. So I really didn't do any work for about the two years I was in New York other than Black Uhura. And I was working for tons of other record companies. I wasn't working for Ireland at all. When I first arrived at the Ireland office, I hadn't been to New York, but when I arrived in like 78, and I went to the office and I came up in the elevator and the doors opened and they were all there to greet me because I was Chris Blackwell's friend and I'd done all this stuff. And the, and the first person looked at me and said, but you're white. The only thing I did was the same week that I did this, I did that. Because as I told you before, I went to New York really to not do any illustrations. But when Bob Dylan called me, I, he asked me to do an album cover. I thought, oh God, I didn't have any materials, anything at all. I just had an, an empty apartment. Because I wasn't doing any of that stuff. And I thought, well, I've got to do, I've got to do that. So I went down and bought some pastels and um, a piece of paper. Because with pastels, you can really do something fast in a way that oil paint, which I would have done the Bob Dylan cover in oil paint, takes, take, you can do it with pastels very fast. So I had all these pastels, and then I was asked to do the Black Uhura. And so the Black Uhura was exactly the same technique 
with a box of pastels. I did that Bob Dylan, you see. And right up to the age of 30, if you said to me, who do you want to meet in the whole world? I said, well, no, if I could just look through a window and see Bob Dylan, that would be it. I wouldn't even have to meet him. So well, the day he called me up, I said, hi, it's Bob Dylan. I mean, my whole life had been a load of very, very strange, amazing things. So when he pulled up and said, hi, it's Bob Dylan, I didn't think it was weird. I, but I did. I was thinking as he was speaking, God, this could have been Eric Clapton or George Harrison, and I wouldn't have cared. It's Bob, it actually is Bob Dylan. I see. Wow. That, so I kind of, you know, when these things happen, you're on what the American Indians would call the pollen path, that you're on the right path. He said, I've been looking for hundreds of artists. No one can do the thing I want to do. I had this vision and I and I've won an artist to paint a picture of this vision. I and he said, I think you could probably do it. I said, yes, just describe it. So he described it. I said, fine, okay. And I sent him off a sketch. And he called me up and he said, it's great, that's it. How did you do it? I don't know how you did it, it's perfect. And I said, that's the sketch. He said, no, no, it's perfect. It's gonna win an award. Which of course, it was universally hated, of course. Because it's Christian art. And at the end of the meeting, he said, you should come on tour, bring a camera. And um, so I went on tour and things for about a month and did different versions of the thing did things for the inside cover and things. And that was the story that, that I'd done. What he described was exactly what I produced for him. When I left England, it kind of opened the door for Island Records to bring in an art guy. And it was bad because uh, then there was this one art guy that stopped anyone else working. It had to be his, his stuff, his stuff. And uh, all these men, all these guys that had done all this stuff, who were very talented. But sometimes that because they're working me, they do covers of their own. They'd be given work to do. They all lost their, they all lost the whole island thing. They, they weren't allowed to do anything anymore. As I was not allowed to do anything, because I remember I was living in America, I'd gone to America. And I started and I did a couple of things for the island office in England. And this guy stopped them, threw them out, said, I'm not, I'm not going to have anyone else do anything that I didn't do. He could not interfere with Marianne Faithful. If Marianne Faithful came to me and I would do something for her, he couldn't interfere with that. He couldn't interfere with Robert Palmer. He couldn't interfere with Steve Winwood. But every other thing, he stopped. And within about 18 months, I said, no, I'm not doing And they got a call from like Suzette Newman. Can you do this for the English office? I said, no, forget it. Were you referring to the Reggae Greats series? I, I know they did their own Reggae Greats. No, I was referring actually to that I literally flown to England to do the Countryman poster. And I was completely immersed in the Countryman film. You know Countryman? Yes. And I had this image, Countryman, and I thought it was good. It's kind of mystical. And we took it into, Chris and I took it into the office. And there was this guy, I'd never seen him before. And I thought, oh, I see they've got an art director now. And he went, oh my God, no, 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 no. I thought, what the fuck? This is beyond belief. And he, uh, he ended up winning, as these people always do, because you only really argue about stuff that you really, really care about and you know it's going to help the project, like the B-52s. But I know the reggae grace. Now, that was a joke on him because I, I, at that point, had left New York and gone up to Woodstock, and I wasn't really doing any album covers. Occasionally, you know, as I say, Marion Faith would call me and I would do something for her. Steve Wynn would call me, I'd do something for him. But I wasn't really involved in the office. And Chris came up with this idea all to him by himself that he wanted this series of album covers called Reggae Grace. And he designed them himself. He said, they're just these pic pictures. The office will send you these pictures. And I just want two colors, absolutely flat. Kind of like, you see, you see the, 
the B-52s and, and after the data, they're very different, but they're both very flat. They're dominated by flat yellow, flat green, you see? So they had, I want to do these flat things, two colors, and every single one of them, I want different, different colorway. And he was saying, you know, like the bumpers prints, and I wish I could just show you, because in that book, do you remember I told you about the bumpers prints on the wall of the Mr. Freedom? So he was kind of recreating what, what I'd done in Mr. Freedom, because he said, I want all those things, like, you know, the bumpers prints on the wall. As individual record co covers, no, they're not great album covers at all. But when you put them all up in tower records all together, they look great. You could not miss them. And it was kind of funny that this guy made sure that they weren't used in England. And he thought he was not making sure my work was not used, but he wasn't. He was making sure Chris Blackwell's work was not used. And really that experience was why in about 1987, when I was like 37 and I had a couple of kids, in New York, and the island office there became corporate, big time, because you too suddenly had sold millions of records. And they were all trying, desperately trying to get, people were coming in trying to be their art director, because there was no art director, because everything was being done exactly the same as it had been done in, in the 70s. Me, other people, you know, no one stopping. The idea of stopping someone doing an album cover and you're taking your power and say, get rid of that. I don't like it. It's really rude and horrible. I mean, it never happened. So I took on the job of being the art director of Island Records about the age of 37, because I knew I would never do another album if there was another art director that came in. And I had to, so I built an art department. And within about a year, it was a really great art department. And they were no longer like designers, they were art directors, because I would just assign them the different acts and not interfere. So I had to then be called the creative director, because I was their boss. But that's how we ran from about 1987 through to the sale of Polygram, well, on through into Polygram and Universal. We had all these different labels. One of them was Fourth and Broadway, and I forget which, and they were designated different kinds of music. And Fourth and Broadway, because the office was Fourth and Broadway in New York, in Greenwich Village. And uh, anyway, I was going to show you this because I love this because it never went anywhere. And we had a, we, next to Fourth and Broadway was a street called Great Jones. And so we had a label called Great Jones, right? And so that this is like one of the things that I would make that someone like you would never have seen, right? So there is Great Jones. Can you see him? So that was the Great Jones label, you see, with um, that, that's, you know, it was very, very, very interesting time in New York at that moment. Very, very connected with the magazines, shops, everything, you know. No one wanted to go to work for Universal, but I found it was just the easiest place to work in the world. Didn't mind it at all. Because they, I went to, uh, I went to meet Johnny Barbis, who was the president. And I said, you realize, Johnny, I don't come into the office. I work remotely. And they said, I don't give a fuck where you work, Tony. Just as long as the work has happened. But wow, this is incredible. And suddenly we had massive budgets, massive expense accounts, a lot of work. And, our, and the art department there in New York was, was all independent. None of my art department were ever employees because you cannot have a creative people being paid on salary. They've got to be independent, freelancers. So they came in every day and they worked in the island office, but they're all freelancers doing their own thing and making a hell of a lot more money than they would as employees. But, um, and at the beginning, Universal, you cannot have an art, but you cannot have people here who are freelance. And I said, well, I can't do it then. And they let, they let me do it. And then they realized how much money they were saving by not paying salaries, you see, and not paying health insurance. And bit by bit, and they realized, and these people are really good. They're not just pay stuff people. They're actually art directors onto their own right. And all the other labels like Def Jam, Elton John's thing, 
Margaritaville, they all started using this island art department, which became basically the art department of uh, Hologram Universal, which really pissed off Chris. Because he would say, what the fuck are you doing album covers for Elton John's label, you know? And uh, he got more and more fed up with being around Universal and left. So I don't know how long we were there. Probably about eight years or something, but it was the easiest time in my life from coming from a cutthroat, independent, you know, record company of every day. It's like, oh my God, oh my God, no money, no money. To this kind of bland, yeah, whatever. Incredible. But of course, the bland, whatever, does not produce great stuff. It's that war that produces great stuff.